One of the great insights he had was that every changes in history happen with some dynamic person or movement. And that person or movement gets followers. And those followers try to maintain what that original founder came up with. And in the process of doing that, they often codify things and make structures and so forth. And then the way they've codified things and the structures that they've made, they keep what the person was saying and they lose some of what the person or movement was saying. And that's certainly true with Luther, that this happened with him. Because when he, when he started, I don't want to say started the Lutheran church, but the, the Lutheran movement, he had followers who were with him. A very intimate person with him was Philip Melanchthon. And Melanchthon was in some ways much more systematic than Luther. People have tried to write systematic theologies on Luther. <laughs> and uh, Paul Alhaus has done a pretty good job of it as far as that goes. But it's very difficult to do that because Luther was a person who reacted to the situations of the day. And as he reacted to them, he would, he would, he would find out what principles he was operating by. And that was fine. But he could sometimes do really interesting and we would say crazy things. Um, one of the, the Lutheran princes, Bob, Rulers found out that uh, he didn't read about his wife. Uh, it was a um, was a political marriage, and so he fell in love with another woman. And so he asked Luther, "What should I do?" And Luther said, "I'll marry her, but don't tell me." <laughs> uh, so he was responding to the situation, but not out of any necessarily hard and fast sympathetic system. So Luther could be that way. It was not necessarily super organized. Um, Bill Langton, on the other hand, he was a great Greek scholar, but he also he also was very systematic. So when he wrote his theology, he wrote it using Aristotelian categories, and he did it make, making different points, low sign, as he would call it in a very systematic way. So after Luther died, the Lutherans were pretty good at quarreling, and what was made it work, <laughs> we've been very good at that our whole career. <laughs> he, he made it worse because, uh, because the followers of Luther said, we're going to systematize what you've done. And so Melanchthon used his logic to actually open things up. He was the principal author of the Augsburg Confession. Luther couldn't go to Augsburg because he was an outlaw. So Melanchthon went instead. Melanchthon wrote out this confession. Luther, of course, approved of it along the way. But in the process of that, the Lutheran princes adopted it in Augsburg in June of 1530. And it became the Augsburg Confession. But Melanchthon had this view, well, I wrote it, so it's kind of my baby, and I'll change it if I want to. <laughs> I want to. <laughs> I want to get more happy, be more closer to the report. Well, this caused a big hubbub, of course. And what happened? Well, the Lutheran said, no, we've got to hang fast to Luther. Some of the Lutheran leaders. So they ended up, they ended up with saying, we're going to stand by the unaltered Lutheran confession. Whenever you read these Lutherans, and even America, they will say, we stand by the unaltered Lutheran confession. So that was the principle that they had. Now, these Lutheran intellectuals after Luther had died, there was a war in 1546, the small called war against the Catholics versus the Lutherans, and the Lutherans lost. 
and King Charles had to come in and try to impose Catholic ways upon the Lutherans, and that did not go down very well at all. And he wasn't able to do it in the end. But some of the people thought that he, some of these Lutherans gave up too much. And so they ended up saying, no, we've got to be more strict. So then they ended up producing what's called the formula of Concord. Now, not all Lutheran countries accepted the formula of Concord. Many of the German principalities did, but the Norwegians, the Danes, the Swedes, they said, no, we're going to stick with the Oliver Confession. That's enough. And Luther's Catholic. So Lutherans, from the very, very shortly after Luther died, found themselves disagreeing again and again. So, all right. What happened? Well, the Lutheran leaders, many of them came to develop what is called Lutheran Orthodox. Now, the word Orthodox is very, where you have to be careful because Orthodox means to be having the right views, uh, basically, that you're in keeping with the general teaching of the church through the confessions and so forth. You are therefore Orthodox, you're not a heretic. So, but when I talk about Lutheran Orthodoxy here, I'm talking about a particular kind of Orthodox. The Lutheran Orthodox teachers and readers, they said, if you're going to be a Lutheran, you have to have right belief. And your right belief includes you know, the sacraments and Christ dying for our sins and uh, grace and so forth. But you have to have this doctrine, this doctrine, this doctrine, this doctrine, this doctrine. If you agree with all these doctrines, then you're a good good. Now, that was kind of a handy theology, actually, because remember, Roman Catholics had, had the Council of Trent, started in 1545, the year before Luther died, it was on and off until 1563. And they had it developed. If you're going to be a good Catholic, you're going to believe this, you're going to believe this, you're going to believe that. And so that was that was their statement of what you believe. And the Lutherans had the Augsburg Confession and one of the Concord, that was their statement. As we'll find out, the Reformed people also came up with their own statements, most clearly expressed in the long run by the Synod of Dort in Holland in 1680. So you have these different religious groups, each with very clearly defined doctrines. So there was a time of, of orthodoxy emphasizing right belief. Now you might think, well, that was back then. Uh, it isn't. <laughs> so what in reality, right here in America, right now. Cities have very much that belief. Go to Missouri Synod, go to Wisconsin Synod, you're going to find Lutheran Orthodoxy operating. So, anyway, after the Orthodox, Orthodoxy was there, and Orthodoxy ended up being a good theology for a time of war. And there was plenty of war. Small call war, 1546. And then we have this rather interesting situation. Charles the, Charles V, the one who said Luther was an outlaw and all the rest, he, he was king not only of the Holy Roman Empire, he was not only the Holy Roman Empire, but he was also king of Spain. And he also inherited. Holland and Belgium, the Low Countries. Well, as the Reformation moved on, the people in Holland, particularly the people in Switzerland, they said, some of them said, we're going to be reformed today. Follow means Zwingli and Cal. But some, some of the people in Holland said, we're going to be Protestants too. But we're not going to be doing that. Going to be before. And so, King Charles said, 
No, you're not. And so there began a war. That war lasted on and off from 1555 to 1648, almost 100 years. The conclusion of which was that Holland was allowed to become a reform country. And Belgium was split off so that it could stay Catholic. Let the Catholics go Catholics. So these wars that they had were often for many things other than religious reasons, but they often expressed them as religious. Now, this is especially true that daddy of all wars, the 30 years war, 1618, 1648. That war is very important for It was terrible for Germany. Keep in mind that Germany was not one nation. Germany was many, many small principalities. And um, France was a big world power at the time. Spain was a big world power at the time. England would get back to England later. They were another world power. The Pope had his own armies. And all of these intermeshed and struggled against each other. 1618, they began the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War, for economic reasons, for political reasons, for empire competition reasons, all kinds of reasons, but it was also religious. And it was a terrible war. One third of the people of Germany were killed in that war. It was awful. And at the end of the war, with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, he ended up saying, whatever the ruler of a nation is, that's the religion of the people as well. And if you were a different religion, beware. <laughs> some of them will tolerate you, kind of, some of them will attempt to destroy. That 30 years war has a direct implication for what happened to Lutherans in America. By the way, a world power at that 30 years war was also a place called Sweden. Sweden ruled over Finland and Sweden, parts of Poland, Estonia, parts of the Baltics. It was his big power, and its leader was the state of Sadonis. And uh, he was actually killed. But it was an important country at the time. We'll come back to that in a while. All right, so these wars made a lot of difference in the world. I've done a whole lot of lots and lots of things out there. Anyone? Any questions? Comments? Is the orthodoxy you were talking about between the Catholics and the Lutherans quite different or were they similar? They believe quite different doctrines, but they were both. Similar and being quite rigid that my way is the right way. That's how we're going to use the words. And this 30 years war was Catholics against everybody else. No. No. You're Catholics and sometimes by the Catholics too. So it was country against our feet to them against me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. No, that's fine. Right. No, it, it was complicated, but yes. Just a general observation. Aren't most wars? For other reasons, but get couched in religion because that's what people rally behind. You got it. <laughs> people want an ally, and the best ally is God. Yeah. <laughs> so. But if you unpack the real reason. Yeah, there are, there are a multitude of reasons, and for some people it was religious because that's how they define reality. Yeah. But. But I'm just thinking about January 6th, which wasn't a war. There was a lot of Jesus there. Mm -hmm. Crosses and you know a lot of holy calling to this, which is just very scary to me because that Jesus is not the Jesus I know at all. Yeah, yeah, that's right. No, oh, that's right. God's a wonderful ally. <laughs> <laughs> I like that line. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's just kind of better. You gotta watch your tongue. Good watch it. Okay. So, 
used to be one on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> we have Now, while while these things were going on, other things were happening as well. That is to say, uh, over in America, America was just beginning to see the beginning of European colonization. And uh, America with many, many different indigenous tribes lived in a particular area and competed and traded with, and sometimes had wars with their neighbors. And they were basically agriculturalists and hunter-gatherers. And um, they, that, that was American society. But with the coming of Christopher Columbus and people following him, the Europeans came. And as they came, they became greedy. They, they came for greedy reasons. The Spanish, of course, simply came to conquer and to as much wealth as they can could in South America and Central America and the southern United States. And, and uh, that was their, it was, it was a whole nation's theory. Um, the other col colonial powers that were, were developing had, they weren't quite conquistadors, but they had similar desires. That is, they came from a capitalist perspective to trade, to make money, to take advantage of, and to overwhelm the opposition that might be in their way so that they could have their colonies and their mercantile system. So they were capitalists. Often countries would have stock companies and com companies that would form to go out and find a lucrative trade. This is particularly true with the England and with the uh, with the uh, Dutch as well, and a little bit the Swedes. So they, that's how they operate. So when the Europeans met with the indigenous people. Indigenous people would lose. They would be overwhelmed. Disease, war, all kinds of things. And losing their land, their culture, being pushed back into kind of reservations. This was the reality that they faced in the, in the, as they encountered the colonists. Now, England probably deserves some words by itself because it's going to make a lot of difference in American history. And of course, they started their involvement in America in the early, late 1500s and in the early 1600s. Now, they go back to English history for a moment. They also became Protestants, but they were Protestants with a different they didn't become Protestant because of doctrinal reasons. Luther said, you know, we are saved by grace through faith. No, they became Protestant because Henry VIII wanted a divorce and Paul wouldn't give it to him. So, heck with you, Pope. And um, so they did develop a certain theology, the 39 articles and so forth, but theology was not their major concern. However, when Henry VIII first read Martin Luther, he didn't like it. <laughs> and so he wrote a critique of Martin Luther, and the Pope said, Yay, Luther, you're a defender of the faith. <laughs> and he still carries that title to this day of the English King does, defender of the faith. So, but Henry had his own opinions about how the Protestant country should be. It's kind of convenient for him that he could then take over all the monasteries and get himself a little bit of wealth in the way. But in any event, he uh, went through his wives and uh, he died. He had three children. Thomas was Edward, and Edward uh, was raised as a Protestant. Uh, and uh, 
but he only lived in Rule about six years. And he died. His older sister, Catherine of Aragon, became a Mary of Aragon, Mary, Mary, became queen of England. She didn't like Protestant doing one thing. She was a Spaniard. She was a Roman Catholic through and through. And so she persecuted Protestant leaders. The ones who weren't arrested and killed, many of them fled. They didn't flee to Wittenberg and Luke's land. They fled to Geneva and Calvin land and Strasbourg and Reformed lands. So they imbibed heavily of the reform. And uh, then they went back to England because Mary died and her sister then, Elizabeth, became queen. And Elizabeth became a Protestant, was a Protestant. And so this did not make Spain very happy. And so Spain and England were in conflict and went to war. And you all heard the story of the Spanish Armada and how they tried to come and conquer England and they got caught in the storm and, and they lost. So the relationship between the Spanish and the English was extremely bad. And the English did not like those Catholics at all and suppressed them within England itself and tried very hard to suppress them in Ireland as well. So, little sort of side note there, uh, the Reformed messengers did not have great success in England, but they had wonderful success up in Scotland. And so Scot Scotland became a reform. And then you have the English. So, and the Anglicans kept a lot of Catholicism, uh, but they were still Protestants. So, now, so that was their unique history. But whenever you read American history and you read all this anti Catholic stuff that you do about the original colonists, keep in mind they saw, saw Spain as the arch enemy. For them to put Spain and Catholic together would be typical. Of course, Spain and Spaniards were actually down in Florida and southern part of the United States, too. So. And when the people settled in Jamestown, they built the fort. They built the fort, the fort against the indigenous people, but particularly against the Spanish. So uh, the, that was going on in England. And England kept fermenting religious differences between the Anglican structure of the state and the people strongly influenced by the period, by the Calvinists who became Puritans. And so the Puritans said, this English, this English church is far too Catholic. We need a more pure church. And then they had different views of, are you going to stay in the church or are you going to leave the church? The separatists said, we're going to leave the church. And some of them went up and founded Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts. They were followed 10 years later by those who settled in Boston who were not separatists, but who were pure. So, that battle was going on within the English church, and it resulted actually in, the, in an English civil war uh, in the 1640s. The, there was a war between King Charles and the Puritans. Charles lost his head quite literally in that war. And uh, so the Puritans ruled until about 1660 when he ended up having the, the uh, Charles II come in and be king. So in the 1600s, religion made a lot of difference in England. They were anti Catholic. And there was this conflict between the Puritans and the Anglicans. So that's a background we need to talk about this. So, any questions, comments? Quakers and Puritans the same? Uh, the Quakers took the inner light of the spirit to such a degree that they they came out of 
Protestant Reformation. They talk about the individual before God and wait for the light of the Spirit to speak. So they rejected most all of the worship structure of the church and a lot of the doctrine. Uh, so they were hated. <coughs> they were hated by almost all others, the Catholics, the Lutherans, the Reform, you name it. They didn't like the Quakers. Fortunately for the Quakers, one of them was quite rich, William Penn. He, he uh, loaned the king a lot of money. The king had to figure out how to repay. So he said, I'll give you this land over in America. We call it Pennsylvania. And in Pennsylvania, this Quaker William Penn said, you can have whatever religion you want. He was very, very So. Anyway, I wanted to say some things about how people thought back in the 1600s. Not that I know that much, but I, yeah. number one, many of them, that does include Mueller, many of them came to America with medieval thought in the back of their mind. Medieval thought that I'm talking about is what we call the medieval synthesis from St. Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas had this view that there was this great God created a hierarchy of order in society and in the church. Church is the old archbishop, bishop, and priest, lay people. It's this order. And um, all of being is caught up in this hierarchical order. And um, this is true in society as well. So it was quite, you know, in, in medieval society, you were observed. That's the way it's supposed to be. You were in the city and guild. That's what, that's the niche you were in. So they came very much with this societal view of an order of creation. And we all have a sense that that's true. They did not have the sense that we're all equal. They did have the sense that in a society, everyone should have the same religion. Because if you have different religions, you're going to have conflict. And it's going to, everything's going to tear apart. So starting from Constantine, right on up to Luther, Everybody, the same religion in the society. And at the end of the 30, 30 years war, their solution to their problem was, whatever the ruler is, the people are religion wise. Everybody the same. Well, things would work, didn't work in fact, but that was the theory. So the people that came were being influenced by that medieval synthesis. My understanding of the chain of beings when it was first introduced very early on in time, it was more about mm -hmm. being in a people are all connected. Mm -hmm. If a link is missing, then the chain, the whole society, the whole community is weakened. Yeah. What they did was they took the horizontal chain and they flipped it vertically. Exactly. Yeah. And then they say there's this ranking. But it started out mm -hmm. horizontal. Okay. Yeah, people are dependent upon each other. Mm -hmm. So it started out as a very positive thing, mm -hmm. I think. And then it was split. People just flipped it vertical. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. So that's one thing. Second thing was this orthodoxy that we talked about a bit. I won't go into that, but religion. Religion and orthodoxy were often interconnected. So that if you were a Spanish, you thought the Protestants were of the devil <laughs> and uh, vice versa. So they had those categories. Now, another thing that developed in the late 1600s was what was called pietism. 
Uh, in Germany, that was expressed through Philip Steiner and Augustus Franke. And the pietists were rather sick of everything that had happened with this war and with the orthodoxy. And they said, people need to have their own religious experience. People need to not just believe in the right doctrine. It's good to believe in the right doctrine, but there's more. You got to have you got to have a personal religious experience, and uh, they emphasize that. Some of them said you have to have a conversion experience that you can date. Peter did not say that, but Tom did. And and but they all insisted upon this religious experience. Now, in the reformed countries, this took went off in Puritan directions. So the Puritans were basically Calvinists in the background, but they they also emphasized your personal religious experience. That's why, for example, when the people came to Massachusetts, Massachusetts, they would say. The church is made up of those who can own their religious experience. It's an equal, an equal system, but you all have to have this religious experience. If you don't have it, you're, you're not among the same. So that was the Puritan take on it. In Germany, this is very much true for all of the Lutherans, there was this orthodox, any orthodox, overarching reality, and then you had rising up the pietists, pietists who said, let's get together for Bible study. These pietists who said, let's get together and share our religious experience. We'll meet in the conventicle and we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll do our Bible study. And the Orthodox authority said, no. But then you had this, this conflict amongst the Lutherans. And that conflict the Lutherans carried with them when they came to America between the Orthodox and the Pietists. So, and uh, well, you can't always tell when you're looking at Lutherans which ones they are. <laughs> and uh, you'll have, you have to look at them and see. So, then, then, Another, another thing that was arising at this time was from Francis Bacon and uh, Rene Descartes and some of people like Galileo and Copernicus and some of those, they were saying the old authority that said that the, the earth is the center of reality and all the planets evolve and all the stars evolve around it from Ptolemy way back from the Greeks, they're wrong. No, we revolve around the sun. And uh, that was the beginning. Those people together, the beginning of saying, question authority, question Ptolemy, question the Pope, question the church tradition, question, question. And what do you rely on? Reason. Human reason. Let's find out the truth. Well, this is the beginning of rationalism. And rationalism gave fruit or fruit in the Enlightenment in the 18th century. And it also reflected itself in the political realm. People like John Locke and uh, Thomas Hobbes and Montesquieu and so forth, they developed this theory that of social contract, that people formed societies and governments through the use in some cases of force, but in some cases reason. And that people had, as they did this, they had certain rights that they contracted together for to uh, bring out their, bring forth their society. So these, these people were stressing using reason to evaluate all things and to question all these authorities and seek the truth for yourself. Seek the truth as individuals. 
that's going to bear a lot of fruit in America and even amongst the Lutherans. If you look at the Lutheran church today, you can say, are they Pietists? There are some that are. Often though, Pietists would end up becoming American evangelicals. But are they Orthodox? Some cynics that are definitely Are there some that are heavily influenced by rationalists? Well, I'll guarantee you that some would say that for the ELCA. Yes. <laughs> so, um, all of those things are fitting together. And uh, are they Anabaptists? Why are they Anabaptists? No. No. The answer is, well, they are. They are. There were, when I talk about reformations, I've been talking mostly about what we call the magisterial reformation. That is to say, the magistrates, the rulers of the land, would, would support a particular religious interpretation. And that was true for the Lutherans, for, for the uh, Reformed, and even for the Anglicans. But in Places like Switzerland, way back in the 1520s, there was a movement that not emphasized we are saved by grace through faith, but emphasized we are saved by being a community of Christians. They emphasized what we call sanctification. And so they said, if you're, if you're going to be a community, then you, you have to rely upon on yourself. You have to rely upon your commitment to the community. And so they came to question infant baptism, and they came to question much structure of the church, and they said, we instead want to find our own community of, of right, uh, right living people that will hold to the Christian faith. So you have the Mennonites that came about, the Amish that came about as a result of that. But they were never they were never able to have political authority. The Catholics persecuted them, the, the Reformed persecuted them, the Lutherans persecuted them. They just had to be their own separate community. And they were the ones that eventually, not directly, but eventually gave birth to the Baptist female. Uh, so, so, yeah, but that was a good, that's a good point. It's, it's more complicated, but you could see the seeds of this, this individual stress going on with the Anabaptists that, that came to be wedded to this rationalism. I think the choir people are going to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, any uh, other questions or observations? Okay, well, let's talk then about those few Lutherans that were in America in the 1600s. We don't really don't really know that we don't have records as to the early early colonists that came. Uh, they didn't write down what the religious preference of their people with them were. So you just have to go by supposition. They came from a Lutheran land, the chances are pretty good that they're Lutheran. Uh, and so when the Dutch took over in um, New Netherlands, uh, they brought with them some Norwegians, some Finns, uh, and uh, so it's quite likely that there were even from uh, the 1620s, there were probably some Lutherans in New Netherlands. <clears throat> now, it's difficult to say for certain, but keep in mind that we're still in time of the Thirty Years' War. So Holland was uh, fighting against Spain and so forth, and Holland had a couple, had two different things operating at the same time, because they were great traders, and they ended up going out to Indonesia via South Africa. And um, they, they wanted to get as much trade as they could. And so religion to them, for the 
Dutch East Indies Company, religion for them was not the most important thing. Getting sailors who would go and getting people who would do what they needed to do, that was more important. And so they would take non-reformed people. As the war went on, the reform after the Synod of George was very conservative. They said, this is the true doctrine, and this is what reformed people believe. And since we are a reformed country, you believe it. Uh, but Holland itself was such a trading country and so diverse, they had a lot of people in their land. And so if they wanted to get these people that helped keep them with the trade, they had to be a little lax about some things. But uh, officially, they were not lax at all. So and that was happening in Holland. And they exported that to America because when it got to America, the, the Dutch leaders, one we know most is Peter Stuyvesant, uh, he was very, very strict. And uh, he got a couple of, of the reformed preachers that were even more strict than he. And even though they had these Lutherans that were there, uh, they suppressed them. The Lutherans from 1623 would meet in houses and they would read sermons and so forth. And for a period of time until the Stuyvesant took over, they were able to get their children baptized by Reformed preachers if they simply confessed the general Christian faith. When these preachers from Holland came, they said, no, they have to confess the sin of the Dorf's faith. And that caused conflict. But the Lutherans were stubborn group anyway. Uh, they didn't give up. They kept meeting in their homes. They actually requested, we want pastor. And Stuyvesant said, no. And then they appealed to the, they appealed to the Dutch East India Company. The Dutch East India Company said, yeah, we agree with Stuyvesant. But Stuyvesant, you be gentle about that. Don't get to be too tough about it. But Stuyvesant was Stuyvesant, and he was Lewis. And uh, he also had a problem down, down the Delaware River from him because these stupid Swedes came along, and they decided they're going to have their own colony. And they hired Peter Minuit. You might know him as the guy who bought Manhattan for his $24. Mm -hmm. uh, he arranged with the Swedes need to have a colony along the Delaware River. So in 1638, they came and they founded the New Sweden. And it was along the Delaware River, so it included New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York. And uh, this did not make the Dutch and New Netherlands very happy at all. And uh, But they coexisted for a while. And then the, they got a new governor for New Sweden. He thought, I'm going to take over this, this Dutch fort here. So he went over and tried to conquer it. He did. This made Stuyvesant very unhappy. And so he came down with the Dutch and they conquered New Sweden. So when you look at what was going on in the 1600s, then you have primarily two Lutheran establishments. You have the Dutch speaking establishment in New Netherlands, which was eventually conquered by the English in 1664 and finally in 1673. And then you have the Swedes. Now, New Sweden existed as, as a, its own place that Swedes were trying to continue to support. Uh, remember, they did this during the Thirty Years' War when they were a little power. But even after they quit being a world power, they did feel a responsibility for these people in America. And so they would send priests or pastors to them every once in a while. So they had kind of erratic pastors. They never did have a bishop that would ordain in one year. We're going to get in the next time we're going to talk and see that they actually did allow a non-bishop to do an ordination in America rather remarkable that they would do that. But in any event, they, they uh, these, these two Lutheran establishments were there. 
in the middle colonies uh, in the 16th century. As far as other Lutheran congregations, doesn't seem to be many. Uh, first Lutheran that pastor that we can talk about that was in North America was Rasmus Jensen. And he went up with Henry Hudson into the Hudson Bay up there and uh, died. <laughs> uh, but he was he was the, the first recorded Lutheran pastor in North America. So that's the Lutherans in America in the 1600s. Where physically was New Netherlands? Is that up the Hudson River? It's New York City. They when they were pretty confident that we make it New York. New Amsterdam. Yeah. Yeah. New Netherlands was the area around there going up the Hudson Way. Up the Hudson. And down, then they went down to the side. So in a cluster of New York. Is there a physical church that was the first Lutheran church in America? You know what happened to all those these Lutheran churches? They all became Anglican. <laughs> now you can go up to you can go up to Old Street Church in Philadelphia. That's one of the years. But they all became Anglican. Why? As those Swedes said, we're going to help the Swedes. But they speak English now. Oh, it became Anglican. Yeah. But um, when we get into Muhlenberg, we'll find out that Muhlenberg actually served up in, he served in Philadelphia primarily in New Providence and Tract and so forth. But he also served in New York City. <laughs> and he learned Dutch, to speak Dutch. He was very good with language, and he said, I think you would like to do to get your cross to you. How do you get across to what can I what you do with the cat? Yes. He says, I'm not I'm not like the I'm not like those Germans who think that God spoke German up in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. But as you look at these these little Lutheran settlements, you can see that the the Dutch in New York, they had to get pastors. It's hard to get pastors in Germany because Germany didn't have any single governments. So what happened with the benefit of Muterberg was that he went to Halle, which was, of course, the Pietist University, but they had all kinds of connections with Pietists all over Europe. So they could get pastors. This was his great strength, that he had a way of getting personnel to come to America. But uh, the Dutch, they had to cast about. They got a pastor from Hamburg, and they got a pastor from Amsterdam. Wherever they could get, get them, they did. So the Swedes, on the other hand, they would send pastors to, to America. And the second pastor they sent, Campionis, he was remarkable. He was extremely good with languages, and he came and he, they settled amongst the, the Limpa people and he translated the first catechism into their language. Uh, and uh, he was not the typical pastor. But it was, so it goes to show you that there was a mixture of responses, even to the American society uh, and in indigenous people, generally. They were thought to be hostile and repressed, but not everyone had that view. Well, are we done for the day? We can have more questions, but we could probably be done with our video. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't do any PowerPoint, but hopefully next to the next week I can get some together, but I'm not promised. <laughs> <laughs> because the seven